Let's remain standing and let us read our scripture reading found in John chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. May God bless the reading from His Holy Word. Please be seated. So good morning once again, and welcome to this part three of our 40 Days of Abundance. And the title of our message today, The Necessary Cut. The Necessary Cut. Are there cuts and hurts and pain that are necessary? There are, right? And that's what we will be talking about in this study. Now, in our previous lesson, if you remember last week, we've seen how God intervenes in His children who are not bearing fruit. If you remember in this study, Jesus is using a metaphor about our relationship to him. He is the vine, he is the main trunk, and he's using the grapevine as his metaphor, as an illustration. And that all of us believers are branches. But then there are several kinds of branches representing different kinds of Christians, representing different levels of our fruitfulness. And last Sunday, we took up the first kind of branch. Branch number one, the barren branch. If you remember, these are Christians who bear no fruit for a period of time. And God is a specific, God as the gardener, the special gardener, has a specific intervention to make these fruitless Christians fruitful. What does the gardener do? According to Jesus, he lifts up every branch in me that bears no fruit. And last Sunday, we talked about discipline. That the way that the Father lifts us up, when we are wayward, when we are entangled with sin, when our focus in life is on things, on worldly things, not on God, he comes along and disciplines us. And, and, and last week, we've learned that God has different ways of discipline, right? There are light discipline, like rebuke. There's the medium discipline, wherein there is, what? Chastisement, chastening. But then, if we are still, you know, reluctant to change, if we are still resistant to repent of our sins, then there is what you call the heavy discipline, the scourging. And sometimes God to allow some disease, accidents, sickness, and worse, even death. And we've learned from our lesson, you know, uh, last week that in, in this disciplinary measure of God, Sometimes the worst kinds of discipline is that it's not that we are hurt, but that people that we love are hurt. All right? That is why it's important for us to respond to God's discipline with repentance and submission. Now, today we will come to the second branch. Right? So God disciplines His children so that we will bear fruit. Now, if I were you, don't wait for God to discipline you. You know, let's change. Let's not wait. Remember, I told you, we Filipinos, we wait for our parents to reach number three before, you know, we respond. You know, we wait for our mothers to say, uno, dos, I, tres. And that's the time we do something. You know, God the same, does the same thing for us. Because he's a father and we are all his children. Now, we come to the branch number two. Bearing fruit branches. This refers to a Christian who is already bearing fruit. In other words, this refers to 
any one of us here who are already showing some fruitfulness in our spiritual life. You know, we are praying, we are reading the Bible, we are doing service in the ministry, we are doing good works outside. In other words, there, there's already a sign that life, spiritual life is thriving. Now, what does, what does the gardener do to branches like this? Now, this is what Jesus said, while every branch that does bear fruit, and here's the second intervention of the Father, He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So this morning, we are going to talk about pruning. If last Sunday we talk about discipline, we will talk about the second secret to abundance. And what is that? If your life bears some fruit, God will intervene to prune us, to prune you. So we will be talking about pruning this morning. All right? Now let me start immediately with the first point of our lesson, the principle of pruning. The principle of pruning. Why do you think we need pruning? All right? Some people are asking, is pruning, somebody in our Bible study group asked me last week, is pruning and discipline the same? Now, obviously, it's not because God cannot do one intervention to two kinds of situations or conditions. When we are not bearing fruit as a Christian, you know, you've been a Christian for many years, but you are not showing that you are a Christian. In fact, in the outside, people think that you are not a Christian so that when they visit our church and they see you here, makurat sila. Bradford po ka? Ikaw po, Bradford po ka? Wagi mo kebaw nga puro mo taga Bradford. Nangakurat. Alright? So, what does God do in order for, for us, for that branch, for that child to become fruitful in our spiritual life? That's where discipline comes. But pruning is different. All right? Pruning is about more fruit to come. Now, I'd like to quote from the Missouri Botanical Garden. You know, this is an article in the internet as I was researching about, you know, production of grapes. And this article says, because of the grape's tendency to grow so vigorously, a lot of wood must be cut away each year. Grape vines can become so dense that the sun cannot reach into the area where fruit should form. In other words, brethren, left to itself, a grape plant will always favor new growth. Listen, it will always naturally favor more growth than more grapes. But what is, this is the important thing, what is the desire of God? What is the desire of of the gardener. Do you think the gardener will say simply say, "Wow, more more branches, more leaves, very good." You don't sell the leaves. <laughs> you don't eat the leaves. You don't sell the wood. You want grapes. Right? And so, what does the gardener do? The gardener has to do what? Regular pruning. Right? No matter how vigorous the vineyard will be, one purpose is important. Fruitfulness, more fruit. In fact, pruning is the grower's, grower's single most important technique to ensure plenty of fruits. Now, we need to understand the word prune. All right? The Greek word is kathairo. All right? And maybe this is a, a, a familiar word in, in medicine, catharsis. I don't know. Are you familiar with catharsis? Okay? It's purging. You know, cathyro, it's the same word. It means to, to clean out, to purge, to remove impurities. All right? And it is also used in, you know, in farming, in horticulture. And by the way, I have to connect, correct myself I mispronounced, remember I said something about the, the science or, or this study or this branch of, of uh, 
of agriculture that focuses on grapes. It's viticulture. All right? Viticulture. I think I added an S there. It's not viste, but viticulture. Okay, that's, that's the, the specific branch of science that really studies and grows. And it is, it's part of the, the, the main umbrella is horticulture, more on farming, right? Now, they are, these are the people, these are the farmers, these are the people who are specialized. And when, when Jesus was using this, this particular illustration, his disciples are familiar because this was very common in, 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 you know, in Palestine, in Israel, in, in that part of the world. They are very rich, they are very fertile, that, you know, plants can easily grow. You know, those of you who will be going to Israel this November, you will really find it so interesting that, you know, you will start in, uh, the, the first place to visit is Jordan. And when you are in Jordan, every, everywhere you go is just brown and rocks. There's no life. But you will just be amazed. The moment you will set foot to Israel, the land of Israel, suddenly it's become what? Thriving with green. And you see all kinds of plantation. You will pass a plantation of grapes. On the other side, bananas. It's life. And all the other surrounding areas of Israel, they're just brown, no life. See? And, and, that, and that, that, that's, that's the image that Jesus is using here. That Jesus is saying, I am the vine. See? You are the branches. If you're connected with me, you will just be teeming with life. But if you're not, then the gardener does something. He prunes, all right? Now, in the spiritual sense, brethren, pruning comes, you know, in the way of testing, all right? If lifting up, if the gardener lifts up the branch that is fruitless and that is discipline, pruning in the spiritual sense is the testing of our faith, all right? So we are going to talk about testing of faith this morning because that is what the Father does. All right? You will not be disciplined if you are fruitful, but you will be tested. Okay? Because we know that if we pass the test, we go to another level of productivity. According to Psalm 66, verse 10 and 12, the Bible says, For you, O God, tested me. Now, notice here the connection of testing and refinement. You refined us like silver. You brought us to a place of what? Of abundance. Notice the goal of the Father. When the Lord tests us, tests our faith, He's trying to refine us. Okay? So, you and I, if you are connected to Jesus Christ, you, are, you and I are all going through a series of tests. All right? And I know, just like discipline, you don't want tests. You know? I want to be a doctor, but I don't want the tests. I don't want the board exams and all those things. Okay? We want to be someone, but we know that you cannot become that someone unless you pass some tests. It's the same thing with God. Right? We need to pass some tests. Now, I want us to focus our attention now on the principles of pruning. How does God prune us so that we will be even more fruitful? Now, this time, I'd like us to open our Bibles to the book of James. So please, open your Bibles now to James chapter 1. All right? And we are going to study a very familiar passage in James chapter 1. Verses 2 to 3, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials. Now, these are not disciplines. These are trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith, you see that? How God purges us, how God refines us, is He will allow us to go through testings and Testings of your faith produces perseverance. Now, quickly, 
let me share to you four facts about trials. These are the principles of pruning. Four facts about trials. All right, number one, okay, trials are inevitable. Trials are inevitable. All right? The Bible doesn't say if you will have trials, no. The Bible says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Notice the word used, whenever. It doesn't say if. Now, in English or even in Greek, whenever you use the word whenever, it means it is bound to happen. All right? It will happen. It is unavoidable. So, meaning to say, brethren, discipline can be avoided, but testing cannot. See, that's one difference. If a Christian is always obedient to the Lord, then there's always a possibility that you won't experience discipline. Why would God discipline you if you are following His will, if you are following His ways? But even if we are following the ways of God, testings of faith will come. Because that's what the Bible says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So trials are inevitable. Number two, trials are un predictable. They are not only inevitable, but they are unpredictable. All right? Notice the second phrase here. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever, that's inevitable, you face that word. The Greek word there is peripipto. Peripipto. It literally means to fall into unexpected events. All right? It is the same word used by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Good Samaritan when the man fell among the thieves. Now, do you think the man was expecting the thief? It was unavoidable. See? It was something that was unpredictable. So in other words, no matter how we try to predict test things in life, it will come. And that is why when you're a Christian, when you're following the Lord, this will help you understand why these problems. Because as a pastor, I always hear these lines. Pastor, why? Why did God allow this? I go to church. I give my tithes. You know, I pray. I read the Bible. You see? Now, this is the reason why. Because testing is not meant you know, to discipline you. See? Never expect that when you are following, when we are following the will of God, that everything in life will just fall into its proper place. We have to understand that those Christians who are growing were tested much. In fact, if we want our lives to be more fruitful, then we need to pass a lot of tests. Amen? Testings are inevitable. Testings are unpredictable. Third, trials are variable. Trials are variable. I'm very sorry if there's not much space in your notes. It's not even there. Okay? You might be asking, why, Pastor Maki? The only answer is economics. In order to produce more, we need to be less. <laughs> All right? And that's pruning. In order for God to expect more, he need, we need to be less. In other words, He has to prune us. He has to remove some unnecessary cut in us. Now, trials are variable. Notice the phrase again. Whenever you face trials, and, and James is saying, of many kinds. You know that word, many kinds there? The Greek word is, is poikilos. Poikilos. It, it literally means multicolored. In other words, when you, when you put your faith in Christ, I tell you, your life is so colorful. <laughs> and, and trials come in various ways. Some trials are easy. Some trials are manageable. Some trials are long. Some are short. Some trials you can laugh. Some trials, you can cry. Some trials, you become numb. 
But that's what the Bible says. You will face many kinds of trials. It's inevitable, it's unpredictable, and they are variable. And number four, and this is the good news, trials are profitable. Amen? In fact, the more trials, the more benefits. Notice what the Bible says in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith, listen to this, produces, see? We are not just being tested for nothing. No. God, the Father, has again, He has the best interest for you and for me. Our God is not a sadistic God. He's not happy when we are hurt. He is not happy. He is not pleased when, you know, when we suffer. No. But God can see in advance what it will produce in you and in me. Amen? The same thing with the vine, with the branches. Okay? The gardener knew that cutting branches would, I don't know, I, I've never been a grape before. I don't know with you. But I'm sure when you cut something, part of your body, it hurts. Now, I've, I should put the picture there, but I don't want to see my finger. You know, Last year, I was pruning. I was pruning. You know, we, I have so many vines in the house. I was pruning, and I was so excited in pruning that when I was pruning, part of my, my finger was pruned. It was literally cut. And when I saw it, I saw it, I Sharon, Sharon, what's naman. Murag si Pope, I saw it. I saw it. I saw I could see my bones all right and yeah this until now until now you know there's still that sensation it's like all well, again grow all right and this this one see this is was last year november okay dili na gyud po pa ang nakita murag si jesus na gyud to kay mayon man asla na ningawas ang pare you know i don't know with the foreigners but you know here in the philippines when you you get a cut you know people say you see a priest inside. This was the Pope. Okay? And this was Jesus. You know? Anyway, my point is this. It hurts. <laughs> you know? Even if plants, you know, they don't have voices. But I think when you made those cuts, it hurts. Okay? But, the gardener, even if the gardener loves the vine, you see, the gardener wants something more than just leaves and branches. That's why he needs to cut. That's why we title this the necessary cut because this will produce what? Perseverance. All right? And that leads us to the purpose, the purpose of pruning. What is the purpose of pruning, brethren? The purpose of pruning is more fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Notice the purpose that Jesus said, why you and I need to be pruned so that it will be even more fruitful. See? You are already bearing fruit. I am already bearing fruit. And for that reason, God will not discipline you because you are already doing good. But God will allow pruning. Because pruning produces. Friends, the ultimate purpose of God, why He prunes us, because He wants more fruit in our lives. And that is good for you and for me. And according to James, let's go back to James, why do you think God allowed the testing of our faith, even if it is painful, even if it hurts us? And notice what James 1 4 says, let perseverance finish its work. See, the testing of our faith produces perseverance, but perseverance in itself is not the end. See, God is not just satisfied that, wow, you're a, you know, a persevering Christian. No, perseverance is not the end. The end in the mind of God is that you and I may be what? Notice the word, mature and complete not lacking anything. See that? That's the goal of God. That's the purpose of God, why He allows pain and trials 
and problems and sometimes sickness to come in our lives. Not to destroy us, but to make us mature. Amen? Make us complete. God's desire, God's purpose in pruning is that you and I will not lack anything. And remember, that's the same thing He does as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Here, the Father is our gardener and His desire. And so the desire of the shepherd and the gardener is for you and me to lack nothing. All right? In our spiritual life. All right? In our spiritual life. That's the purpose. The vine's ability to produce growth increases as the vine matures. See? That's the idea. That's why you don't, you know, there are perennial plants. Like, perennial plants are, you know, they, you grow them and then they just die and then you plant again. What are examples of perennial plants and harvest? Rice. Diba? They are not the same rice. They always die after harvest, like corn. But grapes, no. It's different. They're actually the same vine. And some vines are as what? Centuries old. Why? Because the older, the mature they become, the sweeter they produce fruit. And that's exactly the same Goal of God, purpose of God in your life, in my life. The more we mature as Christian, the more we produce good fruits. Now the question, is that happening in your life and in my life? Are you more sweeter as a Christian today than last year? Because if, 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 if what's happening is not the intent of God, like for example, you are becoming older as a Christian, but you are becoming sourer. Nagka-sour na ka. Nagkatiguang, nagka-aslum. Nagka-saputun. Naunsa naman ni si Christian? No? Grumpy na kayo. Touchy na kayo. See? So, if that's what's happening in your life, do you need pruning or discipline? See? That's the point. Because if we are not maturing, God will change. See, God can easily change His work. Okay? If, if the result of our Christian life is that we are not becoming better Christian, then God, the gardener, will resort to another intervention, discipline. And then when you are bearing fruit, then He changes His style, pruning. See? So the dilemma now is to know the problems that I'm going through today, is it pruning, Lord, or discipline? Now, that's the dilemma. Now, that, that brings me to the third point, the particularity of pruning. The particularity of pruning. All right? What's the distinguishing mark of pruning? See? I'm sure a lot of us, in fact, a lot of those who went through the Bible study this week, that's the question. Pastor, What's the difference? How do I know if I'm going through a season of discipline or a season of pruning? And you know what? I did not answer them. I told them, wait until Sunday. So they have three days of sleepless nights. All right? <laughs> you know, I, I held their peace. Okay? I don't want to spoil. <laughs> All right? Am I being disciplined right now? Surely that's your problem. You know, you have some problems with your finances. You have some problems with your health. You have some problems with your family. You have some problems in your business. And you're asking, Lord, am I being disciplined or am I being pruned? That's the question a lot of Christians ask. Now, here's an important particularity with pruning. All right? Disciplining is about sin. All right? Because, remember, God will lift you up because you are not bearing fruit. You are entangled with sin. Discipline is about sin. Pruning is about self. Now, this is very important. Because in pruning, brethren, God will need to do the necessary cut. And this cut that He does, these are things in your life, in my life, that are not necessarily evil. Alright? 
when you cut branches for pruning, those branches are not evil. <laughs> They're good branches. But you know that if you allow this good to remain, it will stop you from being better. You see, the enemy of the best is that you're just good. But God is not satisfied with just being good. He wants you to be the best. And so what happens? He has to remove these things. But make a God, but Lord, that is good, that is good. Oh no, this is not. Yes, this is good for you. I will remove this. But Lord, but Lord, that's nice. Yes, I know that's nice. But if you keep on holding this in your life, it will keep you from being the nicest. Lord, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. No. As long as you cling to that, yes, it will be nice. It will be beautiful for you, but it will prevent you from more blessings to come. And sometimes we cling on to this thing. So discipline is about self, sin. Pruning is about self. Now here are some questions, all right, that you and I need to answer, all right? Now, you don't have to write this down. I can make this available through our Facebook. All right? So, Diane, please remind me, post this, this table, you know, in our Facebook so that you will, this will be available to you. All right? Okay, the issue, how do you know it's happening? Now, here's the dilemma. Discipline and pruning, they both cause pain. Testings of faith is painful. See? Now, here's the difference. Job, okay, let me give you an example. Job, he suffered. David also suffered. Remember, in our Bible study this week, we talk about David. David committed adultery. David murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And David suffered, right? His son died. See? And he pleaded before God. He fasted. But God says, you need to be disciplined. You know, you're over-abusing your power. See? Job also, his children also died. All right? Everything from Job was taken. Now, question. Put Job and David. Was Job, was it painful for Job to lose his children and all his properties? Yes. Was it painful for David to lose his son? Yes. Both suffered. So discipline and pruning are both painful. Now, why is it happening? That's the question. Why is this suffering happening to you? In disciplining, because you're doing something wrong. David did something wrong. He committed murder. He committed adultery. But pruning, you're doing something right. Now, go to Job chapter 1. Was Job... You know, was Job guilty of some sin? No. In fact, if you read verses, I think it's verse 3 to 5, it says there, diba, Satan went to God. Where have you been, Satan? You know, from all over the world. And, and God was bragging even about Job. You know what? Here's this man. Here's this man that I favor. He's righteous. No one in the whole world is more righteous than Job. See? But both Job... And David suffered. Job did nothing wrong. In fact, he was so righteous that God used him as exhibit A. He was proving to Satan, Satan, I tell you, you know, there are people who will really obey me. And that's when the testing happened. See? Job was tested. David was disciplined. See? Different. Okay, what is your level of fruitfulness? You are disciplined when you are not bearing fruit. You will be pruned when you are bear bearing fruit. See, there's the difference. What is the gardener's desire? The gardener disciplines you because he wants you to have fruit. But gar the gardener prunes you when he wants more fruit in your life. See, he always wants the best for you and me. What needs to go? In discipline, what needs to go? Sin. In pruning, what needs to go? Self. There are things that we cling on too much because of the self. 
See? It could be money. It could be your beauty. It could be anything. It could be a gadget. Things that are not necessarily sin, but God is saying, as long as you continue to hold on to this desire, as you continue to hold on to this property or to this relationship, it will prevent you to be more fruitful. So God says, some things have to let go in order for you to grow and bear more fruit. See? Self. How should I feel? How should you feel when God disciplines you? Well, in disciplining, we should feel guilty and sad. But in pruning, what is that? Relief and trust. Consider it pure joy, my dear friends, when you face trials of many kind. Relief and trust. In other words, it's, you don't need to feel guilty because you know you did not you, do, you did nothing wrong. But God wants to produce more fruit in your life. Okay? And what is the right response? Two different responses. In discipline, we repent of our sins. David, you need to repent of your sins. In pruning, you need to rejoice. Job, yes, you are sick. You lost your family, your business. Rejoice. See? Two different responses. When God disciplines us, we need to repent of our sins immediately. But when God allows us to pass through testings, the Bible says, rejoice. Amen? Rejoice in it. Keep on rejoicing. See? That's why we, we sang a while ago, with Christ in my vessel, you can smile at the storm. See? Storms will come. Storms will destroy houses. It can destroy lives. But you, when you know that the storm was allowed by God to make you more fruitful, rejoice in God. Amen? When does it stop? Pruning and discipline are both temporary. These are momentary things. You will not be disciplined forever. You will not be pruned forever. When does it stop? Disciplining stops when you stop sinning. Pruning stops when you start maturing. Right? Because it's the purpose of pruning, right? So that you become mature and complete. Now, I'm already mature. You say, I'm already mature. Why do I need more pruning? Remember with the grapes. The mature the grape becomes, the more fruit it produces. That's why they never kill or, you know, destroy grape vines. They preserve them because that. The more they grow old, the more they produce fruit. Now, let's go to the fourth, the prime points of pruning. And this is more on a practical, brethren. Okay? What are some of the prime points of pruning? And this is the part where we get hurt. <laughs> prime points of pruning. What are some of the things that God might possibly take from your life and my life? Now, this is where it hurts, all right? Area number one, your cherished relationships. Your cherished relationships. This could mean your spouse, your children, your loved ones, your, lo your long-time friends. A good example of this in the Bible is Abraham. Consider Abraham. Remember, Abraham was promised by God a son, and he waited, waited. Remember, we studied this in the Galatians. For 25 years, he waited, and then the son came. But the son could be a potential idol. You know, Isaac was not an evil thing in the life of Abraham. Isaac was a blessing. But remember, brethren, blessings can become curse in your life when the focus is on the blessing and not on the blesser. See? And that's why God has to test. Sometime later, God, notice the word, tested Abraham. See, it's pruning. It, he was not being disciplined. He said to him, Abraham, here am I. He, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, notice what happened. Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. See that, brethren? 
Sometimes, God has to test how much we cling on to cherish relationships. Because while relationships are good and blessing, they can easily become substitutes for God in our lives. Right? That is why as a Christian, I love my wife, I love my children, you love your wife, you love your husband, you love your children, you love your parents. But the Bible reminds us, your love for Jesus should be more. Jesus said, Matthew 10, 37, anyone who loves their father or mother, notice this, more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So these are prime points of pruning. Check, brethren, your relationships. Are they becoming an obstacle? Are they becoming an idol that you cherish them so much, you know, that it will affect your faith? You know? Some people, in fact, you know, there are true stories that when you know when why they become atheists, and, and you, you know this. In fact, the movie about what what movie was that? Uh, about God, uh, about atheism? What, what what Christian movie? I, I forgot. But then, the, the reason this, this teacher in this movie was an atheist, and you know the reason why he became an atheist? Because I think it was about his wife or son who died. He prayed to God, but then God took the son away, and because of that, he flipped. See? In other words, the testing was there. He failed the test. You know? Instead of admitting and accepting the testing, he totally abandon God and blame God for it. See? And, and that's a potential crisis in life. See? And I don't know, but I have to quote you, Nai. Nanai, it was Nanai who told me here, Pastor Mac, because there was a time, you know, when, when, you know, when Josh and Shantan are sick, you know, I'm worried. And then Nanai always mentions this to me, they are God's, not yours. As long as you know it's His, don't cling on to them too much as if you own them. See? And, and that brings relief because we know that our loved ones, yes, we love them, but they belong to God. They are not ours. So when God takes them, when God gives them and takes them away, what did Job say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. See? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, area number two. You're right to know why God does what He does. And this is even more painful. You know? We were born with the conviction that we deserve to be in control of our lives, right? We want to be in control, yet this assumption is in conflict with the life of faith because we are not. See? We are not in control of our business. We are not in control of our families. We are not even in control of our own health. And so, but human as we are, we have the tendency that, you know, we want. And so when something else happened in this control, you know, our right to know why God should be doing things, it creates a conflict in us, you know. And let me, at this point, let me just share my personal testimony. You know, when Josh was 10, was, that, was he 10 years old or 12 years old, he was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease known as a Miller-Fisher syndrome. Some of you know this. I share this here. This disease is one of the rare forms of the spectrum of the Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome or the GBS. See, it's an autoimmune disease. It's so fast. It, it, it was so fast the first symptom is that we thought he has some problems with the eye because he could, not, he could not clearly see. And then the next effect was his balance. It's so fast that if you don't intervene, it can cause death. All right? And it's rare. There is no known cure. All right? So it started Saturday Sunday, we went to Mami Mimi and have Mami Mimi check over Jaws. And Mami Mimi says, maybe you need to go to a neuro, you know, doctor. And so we did Monday. It was so fast. 
and the doctor needs to know, and so they need to do a, what you call this, a lumbar puncture. Lumbar tap, okay. Something like that. They have to re extract, all right? And I was there in the room, and, and when I saw the needle, I almost collapsed. But I couldn't do anything. You see, they have to do that. Good, Dr. Benson was on my side, you know. And during that time, I let me tell you, I was a pastor already for many years. And it seems like during that time, it, there was just numbness. Okay? It's like I forgot all my sermons. I forgot all the words, the verses that I need. I just grow numb. I wanted to help, but I could not do anything. You see, that's the point. When you relinquish the right to know why God, why God does what He does, when you can't explain it to your son, yourself, see? I could not tell Josh, you know, God, you know, you're going through this because God loves you. Surely he could not understand, see? But the only thing to do there is nothing but wait for God, see? Wait for God. I was not angry at God. It was just full of numbness and you know, it was the longest one week. It, it just lasted for one week. The whole church prayed. Everyone that I know in the whole world prayed. And it was just one, one week. Can you imagine that? The hardest, the most painful. And what went through my mind during that time was Abraham. And I was just telling God, I'm not Abraham, I'm not Abraham, Lord, I'm not Abraham. It was so funny. Why? Because mabot good sa kong mind si Abraham. You know, offer your son. But ko, Lord, I'm not Abraham. I'm not, I'm not going to make a nation, Lord. Your plan for me is not a nation, Lord. I'm not Abraham. See? But, see? I, I was paralyzed at the time. I have to be honest. I was paralyzed. I don't know what to do. But friends, this one, this explains it. Romans 8.28 And we know and the hardest thing there is when the right to know vanish. I know this verse. I know this verse. But at the time, it's like, I don't know. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. I knew that, you know, I love God. I knew that God called me for a purpose. But at the time, the right to know was gone. See? And sometimes that kind of pruning is necessary. All right? I don't wish that to happen. But from hindsight, I would say that changed my life and maybe my wife's life, our whole life. And not just our life. Everyone who knew about the story, that also changes their life. Amen? That's pruning. See? That's pruning. Because at that time, I, you know, I tried to go over, did I, Lord, did I do some mistakes? See, that's why I've told you, every time there are some discomforts in our lives, pain, sickness, whatever it is, it should cause us to again go back to our knees and say, Lord, tell me, where did I go wrong? No, mura na si Joey Albert. Tell me, where do I go wrong? What did I do to make you change your mind? Anyway, let's go to number three. <laughs> you see what happened? We sing. <laughs> All right. Your love for money and possession. See, that's a prime point for purging. You know why? Because money and possession, some said, is the best test of faith. You give person riches and you will know his God. Because where his investments will go will determine who is the God of that person. Remove money and possession from a person and how the person would react, it, you would know if that person is saved. The best test is money. And notice 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10. Those who want to get rich. All right, raise your hand if you want to get rich. Raise your hand to be honest. I want to get want to be rich. See? I mean, I would be a hypocrite, you know? 
Usay bitaw kami share mo sa abos balay ba. Wa na dere nga. Kalami regard sa ilang life no kaning mga rich. You know, they can just go to places ana na. Ang ato ani atong place ang church sa gyud og balay. And when we are invited, we can go to places. But, you know, for them, they can just go to places. You know, to be rich is... But here's the point. To be rich is not sin. Alright? God will not discipline you when you're rich. Of course not. But here's the warning because it's a potential point for scourge, uh, uh, pruning. Those who want to get rich fall into what? Temptation and trap. See? That's where... You, those of us, me, those of us who, who wants to be rich, and those of us are, who are already rich, who refuse to acknowledge they're rich. Okay? Okay, may yung magiging pasta, di sa dato, ha? Di pagyapon ni dato, ang saan may dato, ani nila, uy? Okay, may yung sa pastor, di ba may dato? Hmm, naglibog siya ko, ang saan pa magiging dato, di ani nila, no nga, lagdag ko kay balay, nindagag sakyan na, pero di sa dato, di may dato, pastor. Okay? They fall into a temptation and a trap into, take note, many huh? foolish and harmful desires. That will what? That would plunge people into what? Ruin and destruction. See? That's, that's a warning. Okay? That's a warning of the Bible. Yes, God used rich people in the Bible. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. David was a king. Solomon was a king, but Solomon fell. David fell. See? It will plunge men into ruin and destruction. And then, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And look at verse 10. Some people eager. Huh? So, careful. Those of us who are so eager for more investments, it's not bad, but here's a warning. They have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves, take note, with many griefs. Brethren, I love you so much that I enjoy that you're rich because kung natay mga rich nga membro, maka-experience man po tag rich life, di ba? Mapiskan matas blessing. <laughs> Pero warning, okay? If we are not careful, it will cause us to wander away from the faith. See? It will cause us many grief and it would hurt me also if I see you having griefs. See? That's why be careful. It's a prime point for pruning. All right, area number four, your sources of significance. So these are, these are things that, that God may cause to prune us because these things would bloat the self. See? Remember, on say dapat itangtangon sa pruning? Self. Sa discipline, sin. See? Your sources of significance. So, you know, what would make you feel, you know, good and important and valuable? Alright? Notice Paul. Before Paul became a Christian, who was Paul? Who was Paul before he became a Christian? You know, he was so proud about his, you know, he's a Pharisee, he's a Jew. See? He was so zealous. He, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had all the credentials and this was his source of what? Significance. See, his education, his knowledge of the word. And probably he came from a, a wealthy family as well. See? So he had those sources. But then when Paul met Christ, notice this. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider them what? Loss. See? For the sake of Christ. Was it painful at first when God took this away from Paul? I'm sure it was painful. Because he considered him a loss. See that? But what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So in the life of Paul, before his source of significance was his what? His legacy, his family, his lineage, his knowledge. But God took those things away and God says, that's not your source of significance. I should be the source of your significance. Brethren, a lot of us claim to be Christians, but our source of significance doesn't come from Christ. It comes from our education, from our properties, from our business, from our expertise. See? 
God wants to be the center of our lives. Is when somebody asks us, what's your greatest possession, Jesus? What's your greatest source of significance? It should always be Jesus. Because everything else are just what? Accessories to your life. Some of us have more accessories than the others. But these accessories should not be your source of significance. Amen? It should be Jesus. And, and for Paul, he says, For whose sake I have lost all things. See that? I consider them what? Garbage. That's just even a nice word because literally it means dung. They are just dung. Waste. That I may gain Christ. See? For Paul, at first, it hurts when God took all these things away. But when he realized, it made him more productive. All right? But what's the great expectation? <laughs> Okay, what's the great expectation? We would say, but, well, that's Paul. Well, that's Abraham. Like for me, you know, well, Lord, that's Abraham. I'm not Abraham, Lord. We always excuse ourselves like that, right? I see, see si David, matu, si Solomon, di maku si David, pastor. But here's the great expectation. You go immediately to verse 15. The same chapter, huh? When Paul was talking about losing these things. Because sometimes we might excuse ourselves, I am not Paul, but this is what Paul says. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. Brethren, all of us, see? We can say, ah, si, si Abraham lang iprune, Lord. Kay dako makag-purpose ang life. Si Paul lang, Lord. Lord, ako, Lord, wa man ko kinsa naman ko. No. Pruning is for everyone. You don't have to be a big person like Abraham or David or Solomon to be pruned. The Bible says all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. We need some necessary cut. And so to close, brethren, how should you respond? Your response is everything. Your response to discipline my response to pruning, they're everything because they can make or break your faith. Let me read that once again. Your response is everything because how we respond to pruning can make or break our faith. Now, how should we respond to pruning? Now, this time, let me close with 1 Peter 1, 6-8. And Peter is still talking about pruning. Why? Because he himself experienced the pruning of Christ. In all this, notice what Peter says, you greatly rejoice. See that? Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. See that? Same as what James says, the variability of trials. We have to suffer. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. It's testing of your faith, whether your faith is genuine, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though, notice the word, refined by fire. The word refined there is exactly the same word as kathairo. See? We are being pruned by fire. May result in what? Praise, glory, honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So brethren, how should we respond to prunings in life? Don't get discouraged. Don't despise it. The same with discipline. Don't resent it. Rejoice in it. That's how we respond to pruning. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, it's, it's so, so awkward, Lord, to thank you for testings. But nonetheless, we say, I rejoice in my suffering. Because the more testings of faith, the more fruits to come. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. And we acknowledge, Lord, that you allow us to be pruned. You prune us. Because we need the necessary cut for the necessary growth. Thank you, Lord, that you will always have the best intentions for our lives. 
And help us, Lord, to grow in faith, to trust you in the coming days that these are just seasons of pruning, Lord, because abundance is coming as well. In Jesus' name, amen.